Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearsonet Excel International Elevo Biology Unit 4 and 4 January 2021. This is the part 1 video. I'll put the link to the part 2 video below the description box. So let's begin with the first question. Question 1 says both DNA and RNA are polynucleotides. The table shows how the components of polynucleotides can be represented. So here we have a sugar, we have a phosphate group, we have cytosine or thymine in adenine or guanine. And then there is a covalent bond and a hydrogen bond. So let's see the question. It says, which diagram shows a mononucleotide? Mononucleotide, it means there is only one phosphate. There should be one sugar and there should be one nitrogen base. So the correct representation is this one here. You can see that phosphate is here, the sugar is here, and then we have the nitrogen base. There is no hydrogen bond here. So the answer here should be a B. Moving on. Here they say which diagram shows two components joined by a phosphodiester bond. So for a phosphodiester bond, this is a bond between a sugar and a phosphate. And uh, since there is no phosphate here, that is wrong. We have a sugar and phosphate here. There is no sugar here, so it's only B that is the possible answer. The next part says which diagram shows complementary base pairing. Complementary base pairing is going to be due to formation of hydrogen bonds between two nitrogen bases. And the answer should be this one here. So it should be a C. Moving on. Here they say the diagram shows a sequence of bases in a DNA template, which is the antisense strand. Here the table shows some statements about the new complementary DNA strand and the messenger RNA strand synthesized using this sequence of bases. For each statement, put one cross, which is that, in the appropriate box in each row to show the correct statement about these strands. So what I did here, I wrote the possible strand for the messenger RNA if we are using this as the template strand. To form a DNA strand, it's going to be that. Because in DNA, there is no uracil. Also in RNA, there is no thymine. So in place of thymine, I put uracil for RNA. But for DNA, it should be thymine. So here the first statement says, uh, the number of guanines will be the same as in the template strand. We can try to see the number of guanines for each. Let's see. Here we have one, two, three, four. The number of guanines will not be the same in any of the strands as in the template strand. So the answer should be in neither strand because we see here we have one and two for each, which is two, while the other we have one, two, three, and four. The next part says the number of thymines will be the same as the number of adenines in the template strand. How many adenines are there in the template strand? We have one, two, three, four. How about thymines? Here we have none, and here we have one, two, three, four. So it is true only for the new DNA strand, which is, here I said only the new complementary DNA strand, so the answer is going to be that. The last statement says there will be no adenine present. This is not true because, as we can see, all strands do have adenine in them, so here I said neither strand. Down here they say name the process that synthesizes a messenger RNA strand using the DNA template strand. That is supposed to be transcription. Conversion of whatever is in the DNA into messenger RNA is done by the process of transcription. This brings us to the end of question 1. Let's continue to question 2. Question 2 says many animals have a heart and circulatory system. 5 liters of blood can pass through a human heart each minute. Calculate the volume of blood that passes through the heart in 24 hours and give your answer in standard form. They've told us 5 liters of blood can pass through the human heart in 1 minute. So I said 1 minute, it's going to be 5 liters of blood. But we know 1 minute is 1 over 60 of an hour. So 1 over 60 of an hour is still going to be 5 liters of blood. If it's 1 hour, it's going to be 5 times the 60. And if it's 24 hours, it's going to be that value times 24, which gave me 7200 liters. However, the question said we have to write the answer in standard form. So to convert this to standard form, it's going to be 7.2 times 10 power 3 liters. And that is my answer here. The next part says blood leaves the heart through the arteries. Compare and contrast the structure of the iodor with the structure of the pulmonary artery. Again, both two blood vessels are arteries. And when they say compare and contrast, they want you to give the similarities and the differences. So I began by looking at the similarities, and later on, I looked at the differences. The first part I say, both have valves as they leave the heart. When blood is entering the pulmonary artery, 
or the iota, it has to pass through a valve. Entering the pulmonary artery, it goes through the pulmonary valve, and when it's entering the iota, it goes through the aortic valve. So both of them do have valves at the beginning of these blood vessels. Also, both contain elastic fibers. They contain endothelial cell linings. They contain an outer collagen layer as well as muscle cells. The first difference is the iota branches off to deliver blood to organs, but the pulmonary artery branches off to deliver blood to the lungs. The second one is the iota has a wider lumen. It has thicker walls with more collagen elastic tissues in comparison to those found in the pulmonary artery. So let's continue to the next part. Here they say blood returns to the heart through the veins. The diagram shows the outer line of a vein. The direction of the flow of blood is also shown. Complete and label the diagram to show the structures present in a vein. So whatever you see in blue and red, that is what I wrote here. So because this is a blood vessel, and again, this is a vein, and they've told us the direction of movement is to this side. So we have to position our valves in that manner, the way they are, because for veins, the blood is going to the other direction and the valves are preventing the backflow of blood. So the valves have to be positioned in that manner. And inside the vein, we should have the endothelial layer or what you call the endothelium. We should also show the lumen, which is the space in within the blood vessel. The outer part has collagen. And then we have the inner elastic fiber. And that is what you would have drawn in order to get the three marks that were awarded for this question. So one for the valve the next for collagen fibers, the elastic fibers, the lumen, as well as the endothelium. So this brings us to the end of question two. Let's continue to question three. Question three, humans store energy as glycogen, which is the correct statement about the formation of glycogen. So the first statement says, alpha glucose molecules join together by a condensation reaction. That is true. In collagen, we only find alpha glucose molecules, so C and D will be out. The other says alpha glucose molecules join together by a hydrolysis reaction. That is wrong. The only statement that is correct is by a condensation reaction. So the answer should be an A. The next part says, name the bond that joins two glucose molecules together. When two glucose molecules come together, a glycosidic bond is formed. So that should be your answer. The next part says, explain how the structure of glycogen relates to its role as an energy storage molecule. Remember, they're talking about the structure, so we should focus on that. We know that in glycogen, there are so many glucose molecules that are linked. However, the way these glucose molecules are linked is highly branched in order to be easily hydrolyzed. So I say it, it has many glucose molecules because it is a polymer, so there is potential to provide a lot of energy, that is when they are hydrolyzed. Glycogen is insoluble, so it does not cause osmotic effect inside the cell. Again, this is true because it is a polymer. It has so many molecules, and that means that the bonds are not easily broken, so it's going to be insoluble. The third thing is glycogen can be compacted into smaller spaces, yet containing many glucose molecules. Because glycogen is highly folded, it's going to be able to be compacted into a smaller space which can fit inside a cell. The next part, glycogen is highly branched into of course, molecules that have one six glycosidic bonds or glycosidic links containing glucose molecules that can be readily hydrolyzed to provide glucose for respiration. So these allow us to see why glycogen is a suitable energy storage molecule or glucose storage molecule. Let's move on. Von Grach disease is one type of glycogen storage disease. Between 1 in 20,000 and 1 in 25,000 babies are born with GSD. About 25% of patients with GSD are thought to have von Gerich disease. In one country, 3.8 babies were born in one year. Estimate the number of babies born each year with von Gerich disease in this country. So here, I had to find out the babies born with GSD. Remember, they told us it's 1 in 20,000 to 1 in 25,000. So I took that as a number to begin with. So babies born with GSD are going to be 1 in 20,000 times the total number of people born which gave me a 190. Also, babies born with von Gerich disease are going to be, remember here they told us 25%, so it's going to be 25 divided by 100 times the 190 here, and it gave me 47.5, which is approximately 48 babies because you cannot have half a baby, so it's going to be rounded off to 48 babies. The next part says, 
Von Grock disease is an inherited disease, suggests why the majority of these babies are born to parents who are not affected by Von Grock disease. So if the parents are not affected, it's because the, the condition is not expressed phenotypically and therefore they must be heterozygous if they have the allele for that specific condition, it's going to be heterozygous. So I said, because von Grock disease may be caused by two homozygous recessive alleles appearing together in a gene, since most parents are heterozygous, the allele present will not have phenotypic effects. It means the condition is not going to be expressed phenotypically since most parents are going to be heterozygous and not homozygous recessive. So this brings us to the end of question three. Let's continue to question four. Question four, the role of hemoglobin is to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood. The diagram shows the structure of adult hemoglobin. So this is the structure of hemoglobin. We can see it's a continuous structure. They say state the role of the structure labeled P. P is there in order to bind to the oxygen molecules. So that is the function of that. The next part says, explain the properties of amino acids located in the outer surface of the hemoglobin, for example, at position Q. Because this is a hemoglobin molecule, in this case, it has to be soluble in aqueous or it has to be soluble in the red blood cell. In order to do that, the R groups that are positioned on the outer side have to be polar. So I say it. The amino acids must have R groups that are polar so that the hemoglobin can be soluble in red blood cells or in water. Ignore solubility in plasma, you will not get a mark for that. So let's continue. Here they say the graph shows the oxygen dissociation curves of adult and fetal hemoglobin. We can see the curve has the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen on the vertical axis and partial pressure of oxygen on the horizontal axis. So here we have one for fetal hemoglobin and the other for adult hemoglobin. Of course, we see fetal hemoglobin always has a higher percentage saturation with oxygen in comparison to adult hemoglobin at the same partial pressure of oxygen. So the question here says, explain why the oxygen dissociation curve of adult hemoglobin is different from that of fetal hemoglobin. Remember, every time they ask you to explain something, you need to make a statement before you give a reason why that statement is the way it is. So here I began by saying the oxygen dissociation curve of an adult hemoglobin is shifted to the right side of that of the fetal hemoglobin dissociation curve because oxygen diffuses through the maternal hemoglobin before entering the fetal hemoglobin. Therefore, fetal hemoglobin will need to have a higher affinity for oxygen. And again, this question is asking you to explain why the curves are different between the fetal and that of the mother. The mother loses oxygen towards the fetus. In order to do that, fetal hemoglobin should have a higher affinity for oxygen than adult hemoglobin. So let's continue to the next page. Here they say the structures of adult and fetal hemoglobin are different. The diagram show the structure of adult and fetal hemoglobin. So here we can see the alpha chain as well as the beta chains. And here we see the alpha as well as the gamma. For one is for adult hemoglobin, the other is for fetal hemoglobin. They say the table shows the number of amino acids in each type of chain. In this chain, we see 141. In that chain, we see 146. And here we see 146. So they ask the amino acids in the alpha chains are the same in adult and fetal hemoglobin. So here they say the beta and gamma chains differ in 39 of their amino acids. Calculate the percentage of amino acids that are different in adult and fetal hemoglobin. To do this, I had to find the total amino acids, which is 141 for fetal, 141 plus 146. And for adult, it's 141 plus 146, which gave me 574 amino acids. I also had to find the total different amino acids, which are 39 plus 39, which gave me 78. So the percentage difference was 78, which is that divided by the total, which was 574 times 100. And that gave me 13.5888, which I rounded off to 13.6 to three significant figures. This brings us to the end of question four, as well as the end to this video. Thank you for being with us. Please do not forget to subscribe to our channel. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.